Hello boys and girls, it's Miss Mia here. Um, hopefully you're all healthy, happy and safe at home and you all had an enjoyable Easter holiday. So our new unit of work after Beowulf is Macbeth. Now this is an adaptation, so it's a story adaptation of William Shakespeare's play Macbeth. It's very famous and when you move into secondary school you'll be learning, I'm sure a lot of you will be learning a lot about William Shakespeare and his work and the influences his work has had on modern day society. So um, our next unit of work will be based on this text so it's really important that you do listen to the story carefully before you embark on any of the learning because you will need to have a good understanding of the text itself. Like I said this is only an adaptation so it is missing some information but it does give you a good overview of the characters and the whole plot of the story. During the lessons I will be including some videos and animations which will provide you with more of an insight into William Shakespeare's play. So hopefully all together will give you a really good understanding of the text and that you actually enjoy it. So um, enjoy! So here are the characters, so as you can see we've got the three witches, we've got Macbeth, we've got Lady Macbeth, his wife, we've got Banquo, uh, who is Macbeth's friend, we've got King Duncan, We've got Malcolm and Donald Bain, who are the king's son. We've got Macduff, who is another nobleman. We've got servant and some murderers. So you can imagine there's going to be some interesting things happening in this um, story. Okay, let's get started. Macbeth. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. First and second witches. All day the three witches waited on the edge of the battlefield, hidden by mist and magic. They watched the Scottish army win a victory over the invading forces of Norway, and after the fight was done, they lingered on, gloating over the moans of the dying. As thunder rolled ahead and rain lashed down, one of the witches raised her long-hooked nose to the wind and sniffed like a dog taking a scent. He will be here soon, she said. The second witch stroked the tuft of silvery hair that sprouted from her chin and grinned, showing her gums. I hear the sound of hooves, sisters, she said. The third witch held up a piece of rock crystal in front of her, milky blind eyes. Inside the crystal, something seemed to move. I see him, she screeched. He comes. Let the spell begin. Two Scottish generals rode slowly away from the battlefield, their heads lowered against the driving rain. One was Macbeth, the Thane of Glamis, the bravest soldier in, the ki in King Duncan's army. He was tall, broad-shouldered and had a warrior's face, broken-nosed and scarred from old fights. His companion and friend Banco was younger and slimmer, with a mouth that was quick to smile, although he wasn't smiling now. Macbeth's dark eyes were distant as he recalled the details of the day's slaughter. A hard fight to protect an old feeble king, he thought. If I ruled Scotland, his mind drifted off into a familiar daydream. He saw himself seated on the throne with a golden crown of Scotland circling his brow. Suddenly his horse reared and whined in the, its eyes rolling in terror. Macbeth struggled to control the horse and at that moment a bolt of lightning turned the air violet. In the eerie light he saw three weird hags bearing their way, their wild hair and ragged robes streaming like tattered flags in the wind. Macbeth's hand flew to his sword, but Banco hissed out an urgent warning. No, my friend, I do not think swords can harm creatures like this. A small, cold fear entered Macbeth's heart, and he snarled to conceal it. What do you want? he demanded of the witches. Stand aside! Moving as one, the witches raised their left arms and pointed crooked fingers at Macbeth. They spoke, and their voices grated like iron on stone. All hail Macbeth, Thane of Glamis! All hail Macbeth, Thane of Cordell! All hail Macbeth, who shall be king! Macbeth gave a startled gasp. How had these writhed croons come to read his secret thoughts? The witches turned their fingers to Banquo. All hell Banquo, they chanted. Your children shall be kings. And they vanished like a mist of breath on a, win on a mirror. Were they ghosts? Banquo whispered in amazement. 
They were mad women, snorted Macbeth. How can I be fain of Cawdor? He is alive and well. Of He is alive and well, and one of King Duncan's most trusted friends. And how could my children be kings if you take the throne? Banquo asked. The sound of hoofbeats made both men turn their heads. Out of the rain appeared a royal herald. He pulled his horse to a halt and lifted a hand in salute. I bring great news, he announced. The Thane of Cawdor has confessed to treason and has been executed. The king has given his title and lands to you, noble Macbeth. He has proclaimed you as his heir, our three sons Malcolm and Donald Bain. All hail Macbeth! Thane of Glamis and Cordor. Macbeth's face turned de deathly pale. So the witches told the truth, he thought. Only Duncan and his son stand between me and the crown. My wife must know of this. I will write to her tonight. Macbeth was so deep in thought that he didn't notice the troubled look that Banquo gave him. The witches had left a scent of evil in the air and Banquo seemed to smell it clinging to his friend. Lady Macbeth stood at the window of her bedchamber, gazing out at the clouds gathering above the turrets of Glamis Castle. In her right hand she held the letter from her husband, and its words echoed through her mind. Glamis, Cordal, King, you could have it all, she whispered. But I know you too well, my lord. You want greatness, but you shrink from what you must do to get it, if only... There was a knock at the door. Lady Macbeth started and turned her long black hair whispering against the green silk of her gown. Come, she called. A servant entered. A message from Lord Macbeth, my lady, he said. He bids you prepare a royal banquet for the king. We'll stay at Glamis tomorrow night. What? Lady Macbeth gasped in amazement. Are you mad? She quickly recovered herself. Go and tell the other servants to make ready for the king, she commanded. When she was alone again, Lady Macbeth opened the window and a blast of cold air caught her hair and swelled it about her face. Fate leads Duncan to Glamis, she murmured. Come to me, house of darkness. Fill me with cruelty so I may teach my husband how to be ruthless. A low growl of thunder answered her. Macbeth rode ahead of the king's party and arrived at Glamis just after sunrise. When his wife greeted him, he noticed a hard, determined look in her eyes. The king sleeps here tonight, he said. Is his room ready? All is ready for Duncan's last night on earth, said Lady Macbeth. What do you mean? Macbeth asked. Lady Macbeth moved closer and spoke in a low voice. I guess the thoughts that lay behind your letter, she said. Duncan is old and weak. His sons are fit to rule, but you are. Kill his sons are not fit to rule, but you are. Kill the king while he sleeps and let Malcolm and Donald Bain bear the blame. Macbeth was astonished. First the witches and now his wife had seen his innermost thoughts. Some strange force seemed to have taken control of his life and he thought against it. I will never commit murder and treason, he declared. I will put a sleeping potion in a jug of wine and send it to the guards at the king's door, Lady Macbeth said quickly. They will sleep like babes. I will be easy for you to slip into Duncan's room. It will be easy for you to slip into Duncan's room. I will put a sleeping potion in a jug of wine and send it to the guards at the king's door, Lady Macbeth said quickly. They will sleep like babes. It will be easy for you to slip into Duncan's room. No, I cannot, Macbeth groaned. Lady Macbeth's fist, a face twisted into a sneer. This is your real chance to be king, she said. Are you too cowardly to take it? I'm no coward, snapped Macbeth. Then prove it, Lady Macbeth hissed. Kill the old man and take the throne. Once more, the strange force moved through Macbeth, flowing into him from his wife until he was unable to resist. All hell, Macbeth, who shall be king, he thought, and he could almost feel the crown upon his head. Long after the castle had fallen silent, Macbeth left his room and crept along the corridors. His hands trembled and the sound of his pulse in his ears was like the beating of a battle drum. This is the hour of the wolf and the witch, he thought. When evil spirits roam, the night, uh, the night. And as the words crossed his mind, a ghostly glow gathered in the darkness, shaping itself into a dagger that floated in the air, shining with a sickly green light. Macbeth almost cried out in terror. Be calm, he told himself. This is a trick of the mind. To prove it, he reached out his hand to take the dagger, but it floated away from him and pointed to the way 
pointed the way to Duncan's door, blood began to ooze from the blade, as though the iron were weeping red tears. A bell tolled mil midnight. Duncan's funeral bell is ringing, muttered B uh, Macbeth, and he followed the dagger through the gloom. Lady Macbeth also heard the bell toll, and it seemed a long time before her husband returned. There was blood on his face and hands, and he carried, carried two daggers. You should not have brought the daggers here, said Lady Macbeth. Go back and put them into the guard's hands, as we planned. Macbeth's eyes were blank. He shook his head. I will not go back there, he said hoarsely. Then I will, said Lady Macbeth, and snatched the daggers from Macbeth's hands and left the room. Macbeth stood where he was, shivering uncontrollably, seeing nothing but Duncan's dead eyes staring. He tried to pray, but his lips and tongue would not form the words. In a short while, Lady Macbeth came back holding her red hands up to the candlelight. I smeared blood over the guard's face to make them seem guilty, she said. In the morning we will have them tortured until they say that Duncan's sons pay them to kill him. Her face was so full of triumph and cruelty that Macbeth no longer recognised it. He turned away and caught sight of the reflection in the mirror. It was as if he were looking at someone else, as if he and his wife had become strangers to themselves and each other. Glamis Castle was woken in the grey light of dawn by voices shouting, Murder! The king is slain! Shocked guests ran from their rooms and spoke in whispers. Who could have murdered the king? Rumours flew through the castle like swallows, and suspicion fell on Malcolm and Donalbane, who had the most to gain from their father's death. Malcolm and Donalbane were convinced that Macbeth was a murderer, but they did not dare to accuse him. Who would believe that the hero of the battle against the Norwegians would slay his own king? Though they knew it would be taken as proof of their guilt, Duncan's sons fled for their lives. Donald Bain sailed for Ireland, and Malcolm rode across the border into England to put himself under the protection of English King of the English King. Now nothing stood between Macbeth and the throne. He was crowned, but the th but the crown did not bring him the pleasure he had imagined. His secret dream had come true, but he was disturbed by other dreams, dreams of what the witches had foretold for Banquo's descendants. Have I lied and murdered to set Banquo spawn on the throne? He brooded. I must find a way to rid myself of him and his son. A dark plan formed in Macbeth's mind and he kept it a secret, even from Lady Macbeth, without either of them realising the strange force that had compelled them to kill Duncan was slowly driving them apart. Macbeth held a coronation feast in the royal castle of Dunsinane. Many of the nobles who attended rem remarked that Macbeth's old friend Banquo was not present, but Macbeth laughed when they mentioned it. Lord Banquo and his son must have been delayed on their way, he said lightly. Only he knew what had delayed them, for he had hired two murderers to ambush them on the road. At the height of the feast, a servant brought Macbeth's, uh, Macbeth a message for that two men wished to see him on urgent business. Macbeth hurried to his private chambers and found the murderers waiting there. Have you done what I paid you to do? Macbeth demanded. Banquo is dead, my lord, one of the murderers said. We cut his throat and threw the body in a ditch. Macbeth sighed with relief, perhaps. Now he would sleep peacefully, but then he sensed something wrong. Neither of the murderers would look at him, and they kept anxiously shuffling their feet. And his son, said Macbeth. The reply was shattering. He escaped, my lord. Banquo's sons still live. As he returned to the banqueting hall, doubts tortured Macbeth like scorpion stings. Banquo's son still lives, he thought. Lives to take his revenge on me, to claim the throne and father's sons who will rule after him. Is there no end to the blood that must be shed before I find peace? As he entered the hall, Macbeth put on a full smile to hide his troubled mind. But the smile froze when he saw a hooded figure seated in his chair. Who dares to sit in my place, he roared. The guest fell silent and looked bewildered. The king's chair was empty. Why, no one, my lord, said Lady Macbeth with a forced laugh. She could see something was wrong with her husband, but she could not guess what. The king is jesting, she told the nobles. This is no jest, barked Macbeth. He strode angrily towards the figure, then recoiled in horror as it drew back its hood. For what he saw was Banquo, with weed tangled in his hair and mud streaked across his face with a deep gash in his neck that sent a stream of blood pattering onto the flagstones and haunting glassy eyes that stared and stared and stared. Get rid of him! Macbeth screeched. The nobles sprang to their feet, drawing their daggers, knocking over chairs and wine cups in the confusion. Back to your grave! sobbed Macbeth. 
Banquo smiled. There was blood in his mouth and his teeth shone white through it. Then he faded into the shadows and the torchlight. My lord, the king is ill, Lady Macbeth said desperately. Leave us now and let him rest. In the morning he will be himself again. Myself, Macbeth moaned softly to himself. I will not be myself again until Banquo's spirit is laid to rest. Only the witches can set me free. The witches were seated in a huddle around a fire over which a cauldron bubbled. In the sky above their heads, a full moon sailed, casting silver light over the battlefield, still littered with unburied corpse, the blind which held up the crystal. Deep inside a tiny horse, Anne Ryder galloped wildly through the night. He comes, she cackled. The spell is still strong. And Macbeth came out to the moonlight, his horse's flanks white with lathered sweat. He climbed from the saddle and was about to speak when the hooked-nosed witch called out, The king wishes to know the future! It's not for the faint-hearted, warned the bearded witch. I have courage enough, Macbeth growled. The blind witch dipped her wooden cup into the cauldron and held it out. Drink, she said. Macbeth took the cup and lifted it from his lips, shuddering as he swallowed. Fire and ice and the light of the moon burned in his brain. The blind witch's face melted like the edge of a cloud and became the face of Duncan, his silver hair dark with blood. Beware, Macduff, the thane of Fife, Duncan said, and then he changed into Banquo. No man born of a woman can harm you, Banquo said. You will rule until Burnham Wood walks to Dunsinane. Then I feel safe, cried Macbeth. No one can stop me. And he was alone. The witches, their cauldron and the fire had vanished. It was the start of a fearful time. On his return to Dunsinane, Macbeth ordered that Macduff be arrested. When he heard that Macduff had fled to England to join Malcolm, Macbeth had Macduff's castle burn and his wife and children put to death. From then on, anyone who questioned the king's commands, no matter how harsh or unjust those commands might be, was executed. The gap between Macbeth and his wife grew wider. The guilty secret of Duncan's murder gnawed at Lady Macbeth's mind like a maggot inside an apple. She fell ill and began to walk in her sleep, dreaming that she and Macbeth were still covered with Duncan's blood. Out, damned stain, she croaked. Will nothing make me clean? Doctors could do nothing for her and she grew weaker every day. Then, at last, hope came to Macbeth's suffering subjects. Malcolm had raised an army in England, and um, with Macduff at his side, he marched his troops into Scotland. There, there, the army was greeted by cheering crowds who longed to be freed from the tyrant Macbeth. First, Glamis Castle was captured and burned, and then Malcolm's forces marched on to Dunsinane. To the despair of Macbeth's generals, he did nothing. Each time they advised him to go to battle, he laughed and said, I have nothing to fear until the day that Burnham Wood walks to Dunsinane. Through the windows of the throne room, Macbeth could see the distant campfires of Malcolm's army. He raised a cup of wine to them. Fools! he jeered. You cannot overthrow me! A sound made him turn. A servant was standing at the door, wringing his hands and weeping. What is it? Macbeth asked gruffly. The queen, my lord, said the servant. She is dead. For a long time, Macbeth was silent, remembering the early years of his marriage, when the world had seemed bright. Life goes on day after day, but it means nothing, he said in a cracked whisper. It ends in despair and darkness and death. Macbeth did not sleep that night. He drank cup after cup of wine, but it brought him no comfort, only the certainty that his enemies would be defeated and that he would remain unharmed gave him any hope. At dawn, an anxious faced captain brought the king strange news. The enemy is approaching, my lord, he said. To conceal the strength of their numbers, they are hiding behind branches cut from Burnham Wood. It looks as though a forest is on the march. My curse upon you, witches, howled Macbeth. You deceived me. I've lost everything, but at least I can die like a soldier with a sword in my hand. Go tell the servants to bring my armour. It was a short battle. Macbeth's army had no stomach for a fight to protect the king they now hated, and the soldiers began to surrender to Malcolm's men, first in a trickle, then in a flood. Macbeth fought recklessly, as though he wished to be killed, but he hacked down opponent after opponent, shouting, You are born of women! as he delivered the death blow. At last, Macbeth found himself alone. He was resting against a cart when he heard someone call his name. It was Macduff striding through the smoke of battle. His broadsword at ready. I have come to avenge my wife and children, 
Macduff said through clenched teeth. Stay back, warned Macbeth. I cannot be harmed by a man born of woman. My mother died before I was born, said Macduff, his eyes blazing with hate. To save me, the doctor cut me from her body. Macbeth threw back his head and laughed bitterly. He saw now that all the witch's promises had been lies and that by believing them he had betrayed himself. The force that had dominated him was gone and only his courage remained. Come then, Macduff, he cried. Make an end of me. Macduff struck off Mac Macbeth's head with a single sweep of his sword. The head was placed on top of a spear that had been driven into the ground outside the gates of Dunsinane. The victorious army cheered them, marched away to see Malcolm crowned king. As the sun set, three ravens flapped down from the castle walls and fluttered around Macbeth's head. All hail Macbeth, they called. All hail, all hail. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Okay, well, there you go then, boys and girls. That was the end of the story, Macbeth. Like mentioned at the start, this is an adaptation of William Shakespeare's play, Macbeth. So hopefully you enjoyed it and understood the main plot and the themes in the story and um, that you enjoy this unit of work. Stay safe and hopefully we'll see you all soon.